Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Mad number two is going to be the topic of discussion today. But first, uh, our videos are brought to you by the comic books that we make. I'm going to be in Tokyo Comic Con at the end of uh, November. Last weekend there, sharing a table with Jeff Darrow. Swing through if you're in that region. But on the stands right now today, I have uh, Red Room, the Antisocial Network, Red Room Trigger Warnings, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in uh, Red Room Comics. Each of these books com completely self-contained. Uh, four stories in each with about 70 pages of extra material. Jimmy has Hulk Grand Design Monster and Madness in issue form on uh, the stands right now. It's going to be getting a Treasury Edition format in early 2023. And he has a, a new edition of Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive trade paperback from Image Comics on the stands right now. Thank you guys so much for supporting our books the way you have been. And let's jump right into things with Harvey Kurtzman's Mad Number no. 2. Got hold of the collection of Mad. Pretty nice uh, condition for that. Yes, yes. The, 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 one, the one issue that I consider to be like a... Uh, it, it, it's almost a ceremonial that I have it. We'll never open it, is that issue one, because it's pretty beat up. But every other issue is pretty reasonable, man. 1953... Uh, Harvey Kurtzman edited piece. They're still finding their way with this new uh, form of comics, this new almost genre. You know, like the idea of humor comics before this would just be follow one character around. It wouldn't be parody. It wouldn't be satire. And uh, during these early mad comics, what they were essentially satirizing was their own brand. Uh, there would be a horror section. There would be a crime section and a sci-fi section. Uh, so we start off the bat with, no pun intended, with a, a strip called Hex with the artwork done by the inimitable Jack Davis. No. We start off this issue with an ad for one of their off-selling comics. This yeah. is so atypical from a business standpoint. Like, I used to see people complain about Batman ads and everything, and it's like, Batman's your number one book. Why are you putting more money behind Batman? That's business 101, because every extra copy of Batman is profit. Mm-hmm. They are pushing one of their less selling titles here and in inside cover ad real estate. I'm, I'm kind of surprised by that. Yeah, if you read the interviews with Gaines and Feldstein, the stuff that they were lit legitimately proudest of was their sci fi works. Uh, it was the first Russ Cochran reprint, his Weird Science, the fandom that grew around it. It was Legion and ri Rising Tide raises all ships, doing their best to try to sell a couple extra copies of That's a, noble. a floundering... Uh, That's uh, almost art ahead of commerce. It's what gets to happen if you're the guy who uh, runs the, pr the publishing company and, and your, your heart is going a certain way. It, uh, it highlights some of their business practices, which we then see with the uh, page rates for these artists being much higher than the, the competitive publishers. Yeah. Body Not language. <laughs> Body language, man. With that guy whiffing that baseball... Uh, quintessential Jack Davis pose. He's so good. He's so good. And these remind me of like, I would see Jack Davis. My first Jack Davis is probably ads for things like uh, basketball, uh, yeah, you know, sports stuff. Yeah, exactly. And you see it all here. Like the body language is so good. They're cartoony figures, but also they're not, you know, like you look at the gear of the umpires and the catcher and it's like, yeah, they're a little bit rubbery, but man, it's all super detailed too. There's Great a, spikes, like the, the shoes and stuff, so good. There's a logic to it all. Like you feel the form and the lighting feels accurate. Like you feel how that shoe wraps around the foot. He's somehow underrated <laughs> because I never hear people talk about Jack Davis when you go like great figure drawers. Yeah. You know, he's a humor artist, except guess what? His war comics are phenomenal. Some of the best war comics. He's just a lot more, I think, than what he's kind of known for. He's one of those dudes, too, that's swinging multiple implements when it comes to, comes to ink. And once again, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> but he's got the thick brush with this out, out, yes. outside lines. You uh, use his pen for the recessive marks and like the little details mm -hmm. and things. And then he'll kick in some, some white for uh, texture. It's that cartooning 101, you know, those thick lines in the foreground and the pen in the back. And we're going to see some great backgrounds of these crowds coming in and out. Here it's pen lines and scratches and circles for faces. But there'll be moments, you know, where we get to see like a hundred faces that he's drawing in the backgrounds. Baseball is a good subject matter for a Jack Davis because this is certainly the era of like these hayseed ass baseball players, man, that were like straight from the cornfields and... 
the aesthetics of these characters all reflect that. And it was also that era too, man, where uh, people in the crowd would, would be like known characters, ringside rosy types. It's funny to think of this as a mad story because I kind of get into this story. Yeah. And it's it, it's not an obvious parody of anything. Right. And it just feels like good cartooning. Like, I read this story and I'm invested. Like, it, what's going to happen to our hero here? Such a good ryth rhythm to the, to the dialogue and stuff. And I guess a little bit of it, you know, there was that very famous uh, Tales from the Crypt story that Jack Davis did with the head baseball and yes. things. Um, the superstitions in baseball, too, you know, there are superstitions in, in sports just in general. Uh, all these guys are being helped by God, you know. Uh, so satirizing that is part of the subject matter of this uh, strip. I think he's also um, hitting on current uh, players and personalities. Like, sure. like Yegi, you know, is Yogi Berra is your catcher here. Yeah. And then there's, there's a guy later on, it's, I think he's an announcer that has to be based on somebody. And I don't sure. recognize the reference, but, uh, you know, I think that, that the maybe some of the parody is, yeah, is the, uh, the, of the, the time. The caricature looks like a real real person. And uh, shouts to uh, Marie Severin, presumably, who's the colorist of this, because she really knows how to push things into the background and, and pull out the, the, the important bits. Yeah, those figures are highlighted. You mentioned the uh, heavy outline and versus, like, the pen lines in the background. It's reinforced by the colorist. Absolutely. It's almost like they're a team working together to create this vision. <laughs> when you have these syncopated moments, see, this is that that announcer guy. Where it's like that's somebody. Yes, there's no doubt that that's you know that's that's clearly somebody. Uh, these are the Kurtzman beats that you noticed. Um, so much of Jack Davis is all over these these pages, but look at any other Jack Davis comic that. Harvey Kurtzman didn't have a hand in. It does not have storytelling beats like this. And imagine trying to communicate this uh, in a static comic page without the benefits of animation. I can't think of a better way. No, you want it to be clear, and I think it's crystal clear. Something, something has gone wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> and our guys win the game after a Faustian blood oath with this uh, old, old, old bag of bones. Yeah, like uh, the fourth uh, horror host. She yeah. doesn't have her own title yet at EC, but maybe she'll get one. Yeah, man, straight up Mad Hetty from the S Swamp Thing comics. Man, Jack Davis is such a good cartoonist. Anytime he's drawing, like, multiple faces and everything, it just feels like he's pulling them out of just looking around on the streets or something and, and caricaturing everybody that, around him. That pen is moving. Like, you, I get the sense that... There's not much penciling done there. No, and still, no two faces look the same. That's true. No laziness in that in that part of his game. So, as Faustian blood oaths usually do, <laughs> it's got to come home to roost, man. And our uh, old Hetty is uh, reminding our guy that he made a deal, and she helped him win the game. So, as the guys are trying to get access to their, fel their pal Casey at the bat, uh, they crack into his, his room. He's not there anymore. His little uh, voodoo doll... His trinket, his totem of... Yeah, his good luck charm. Yeah, good superstition sort of falls out of nowhere. They're like, fuck, I don't think we're going to see him anymore. As we see in Full Moon Zine, hashtag, right? Absolutely. Uh, the exit of our dude who is making good on his deal. And I just want to show off, because it's the same color palette, but you can see the difference, uh, you know, whenever you upgrade paper or something like that. Same colors, very different end result. Yeah. Yeah, the patina of... Jesus, it's almost 70 years, I guess, huh? Like 69-year-old yeah. comic. Amazing. And uh, and also the bleed. You know, like that newsprint really did absorb these colors and, and the ink. So you get a little desaturation with that, too. So that was our Jack Davis piece. Man, now let's go to the jungle department, uh, which is not technically parodying anything specific from the EC brand. Closest would be uh, Two-Fisted Tales, I guess, but... You could also think of this as like one of the first comic parodies, if you right. think about That's exactly Bern yeah, Hogarth or, or, or Hal Foster, which is what we will explore more and more as we uh, look through subsequent issues of uh, of Mad. And Hal Foster, Bern Hogarth, super important guy, Hal Foster especially, to this generation yes. of cartoonists. Uh, and John Severin, you know, the guy that I associate with, with uh, Cracked Magazine was in a, every, every one of these issues of uh, of Mad. He's another guy I think of as, as a war comics guy. Mm -hmm. Really good. And then you see him drawing humor and, and comedy, and it's like, 
I think that's what you had to be if you were going to be a professional cartoonist. Like you had to be able to draw these genres and Absolutely. humor was a big chunk of it back then. Absolutely, man. Yeah. You had to be very diverse with your portfolio. Poses like this, it feels just like Hal Foster. Totally. You know, like there's nothing funny about that. It's amazing <laughs> illustration. Absolutely. But that's true. I feel like that's true of comedy, you know, at, at large, like you, you sort of have it running. I wouldn't say serious, but you know, if you want the outlandish to really pop, that means the rest of it's kind of flat or I re- straight. I really feel like th- the Harvey Kurtzman brand of mad storytelling is what influenced like Mel Brooks and like the airplane movies and, and those kinds of parody flicks because you play it straight, but then you have chicken fat. What is it? It's chicken fat, you know, that that's, that's kind of all around. Do shade paper, uh, in effect on these two from the start with, uh, with, uh, John Severin, like he, he would use that on his cracked works. John Severin has whole issues of two fisted tales that are just, he draws them all uses a lot of duo shade on that stuff. Yeah. This is a, such a bizarre story. It's, it's Tarzan and it's uh head shrinkers are, are who he's sort of fighting with here and then calls in the animal reserves with his Tarzan call. Can you imagine and you get this kind of panel is amazing. Can you imagine having to draw all these goddamn animals? Yeah, I love that there's a whale, like, breaching, like, as part of his... It's just a little puppy dog, you know? <laughs> it, ru- it runs the gamut, and uh, it feels like... Like, this is definitely uh, one of those strips that, like, filler, in a way. Because, like, it's all building toward the... I- the joke is trunk and head, and we established this goofus character early on, and now he's even more goofus-like. Yeah, it's odd. Yeah. This, is, this speaks to your idea that this is still Kurtzman figuring out mad. Absolutely. Speaking of Kurtzman, there's a little Kurtzman artwork to go along with the little magazine uh, prose piece. Uh, said it before, but for the benefits of newer viewers, these when you get your old comic and it has a kind of prose story included, that's a requirement by the U.S. Postal Service to get uh, sh- cheaper shipping rates. Yeah. Have you ever seen these stories from the Bible big books? 140, 40 pages? Not, not 30 pages? Yeah, no, not... Uh, Very curious about that I've, I've, I've seen them out, but I, I've never looked through them. And, that, and that, these are the vestiges of Max Gaines. Basically, the, the OG graphic novels, you know, it's Bible stories. Certainly trade paperbacks. I wonder if the artists are some of the same artists. Yeah. Um, Surely not. We'd know them if they it's, were. It's true. Like, when you look at the earliest, like... So there's the pre new trend like this is like the new trend the mad the tales from the crypt and russ cochran put out war against terror and like um a woman a man romance or yeah, you know man, a moon, yeah, moon girl yeah right and the artists were cornballs you know just your standard golden age hacks but then like a wally wood will show up and mm. and a, a johnny craig will show up a graham ingles will show up at the end is feldstein around in those i feel like he's in there pretty early on yeah yeah, I think so. Also. I love having like by doing the actual issues that you have, you get to see those ads and incidental pages, and I'm, I'm such a fan of that. Yeah, absolutely, man. Gookum Sci-Fi Department, and who better than to have uh, Uncle Wally Wood as the artist on uh, the Sci-Fi story doing what he does, man? This is an oddball of a story. It, it really is. I don't know how much humor Wood had done up to this point, and. I mean, you get to see his cartoony chops on display here, and they're strong. You yeah, know, it's good proportions, big, big-headed characters walking around. But talk about a story that I just don't slight is is maybe too generous. It sent me down some rabbit holes because I'm trying to understand context, and that's the problem with with Mad. It's so it's so timely, so topical. Uh, the magazine that we knew. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm putting that baggage that I have and projecting it onto this old thing. So Jimmy, I went down rabbit holes of like reading about Jell-O right. and Wikipedia and stuff. The only thing that I came out with is that uh, in the 50s, Jell-O was already well-established for five decades because I thought that, that, like, oh, it's a new dessert like, thought, and it yeah. must be weird. Want to know the weird thing about uh, the 1950s in terms of dietary consumption? Salad was a new trend in, in, di- in dieting and in dining that there were salad-flavored jello desserts like a celery and like tomato and cucumber fucking jello but uh jello was invented in the 1800s so yeah so i wonder if it's a new marketing campaign that because right, advertising like obviously most... going to be a big chunk of mad yeah stuff the the other uh 
the, like the only other thought that I, I could really come up with with that is something like plastic. You know, like I think of plastics is starting to get introduced, and I wonder if that has anything to do with it. Well, you know what I was thinking is uh, at- Atomic Age horror movies, like The Blob, in relation to Jello, like that, right. like like that's the other place where my mind went. But these are the blind spots that we're going to have as we proceed looking through. Uh, these these early issues of Mad because we we just don't have the context. Whenever you reference like horror movies and you see in this like <laughs> Jello like substance turning into the hand, you know that's that's creeping in. Tough uh, thing to draw, funny. It is you know. Definitely horror references. Like look there. at this anthropomorphic thing and and imagine drawing that. You have it's to weird. you have to think that through a lot. And uh, we, we 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 sold you out on and we spoiled the we spoiled the uh, punchline for you guys, man, because uh, this this gookum. Uh, as it's known on this fellow traveler's planet, is just uh, Jello parfait. Have you ever had Jello with ice cream? No, me either. I, that so- actually sounds kind of good to me. I'm a big ice cream fan. Um, never, never heard of those two together. So that might have been a '50s popular '50s trend that came and went. Yeah. Now here's the thing, man. This issue is all building towards the mole story by uh, Bill Elder. Longtime collaborator with Harvey Kurtzman. These guys went to the same freaking high school, and their collaboration second to none. Uh, it lasted decades and decades and decades, all the way up to Little Annie Fanny. And this mole story has been referenced and parodied by people like uh, Alan Moore, and you see some of these references uh, elsewhere. Will Elder, known for being the uh, creator of the idea of chicken fat, and you start to see little bits of that already. Uh, in this image, it's just impeccably illustrated pen and ink work, and once again, more shouts to uh, Marie Severin's color choices. Yeah, very bold that that blue monochrome for a night color palette. Yeah, yeah. The other place where you, I, I immediately think of her blue monochrome color palette is that 2001 Space mm-hmm. Odyssey Treasury Edition story that she colored with uh, Jack Kirby. It works so well if like the payoff is going to be you know gold and money. Uh, nice contrast once he pops up in the vault. It really does, man. And uh, for the virtuosity of Bill Elder's uh, drawing skills, just having these gun muzzles to- totally works. You know, you don't need to get de- too detailed with it. Just yeah. these cylinders. 100%. Evan Dorkin, man. How much DNA of, of uh, Will Elder is in Evan Dorkin when you look at a panel like that? Absolutely. And it feels like this strip is the one, in terms of pacing, layout, and all the rest that Kurtzman spent the bulk of his energies. And it's it's page turn stuff. So we have this image right here. And when we check out the next page turn, it's the same beat happening in that same panel. It's even Brunetti stuff where it's the same size yeah. as, as we like close each page. It's kind of the same size of this character rolling through. And check it out, man. Same deal. You know, it's the same beat each time. This one, too, where he has the realization of, like, what his, like, implements are. <laughs> uh, well, I guess it's not the same, but but it's, uh, you know, the same composition on the previous page. And he gets it, you know, here and here. So just, like, the layout and the attention to detail in terms of putting this story out there is very intricate. And what we're seeing also with the cartooning, and I bet we, we got to give a lot of that um, gun barrel stuff to uh, the credit to Harvey Kurtzman because it feels like oh, so yeah. rubbery, right? You, you could see the Kurtzman underneath this work. Yeah, Will Elder is so good. He really is, man. It's so on display in this one. And I wonder if there's stuff here too that's um, almost situationist or some kind of like post-industrial revolution kind of stuff because we're seeing the mold just getting stripped down and down right. and down, eventually shaved and naked, <laughs> you know, like as he goes through life and trying to make that money and by the end it's just... You know, nothing left of just just worn down to almost the nub of a man. <laughs> you know, when he comes crawling out here at the end, there's just nothing left of him. Yeah, like literally, he's, he's missing teeth. He's <laughs> naked. Like, and they're done with him, man. He's a three-time loser. Yeah, the system's been hard on on our poor uh, poor hero here. Here are our ads. Cigarette later. That's so funny, wow. isn't it? That's amazing. You think of what, what, what they're going to take them to task for in the Senate subcommittee hearings. How about selling cigarettes to kids? <laughs> <laughs> With attractive childlike imagery. And uh, I think this is probably some correspondence school stuff. 
Yeah, that was always a popular one. Radio television technician, Jimmy. I, I, it, I'll tell you what, man. If you'd have done that correspondence course, you'd have probably been set up pretty well. I think so too, period. man. In my in my lifetime, living down in Homestead, there were two uh, stores that still sold uh, big ass vacuum tubes for the little old ladies and shit that mm-hmm. lived in town that had to cart their whole TV in, fucking take these tubes Jeez. out, put it on a thing to see which vacuum tube is is the one that's busted. Things have changed. Yeah, that's a, that's the forty year old uh, floor model TV they're bringing in there. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's bigger bigger than this room, and it's like a thirteen inch screen. It is, yeah, 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 absolutely. Because you need all those goddamn va- big ass vacuum tubes. Good to go, Jim. Yes. Okay, favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, tell the people what's out there, man. Hulk Grand Design, Monster Madness is in stores now. Comic book size, 40 page uh, each issue retelling of the Hulk 60 year history. But the collected treasury size edition will be out in early 2023. Man, that is the book I've been working on my whole life. So pre order that one now wherever you buy comics. And Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive from Image Comics is back in print after almost a year. I've seen these second printings. They are beautiful. Very happy with those. So pick that up wherever you get comics. Eight complete full-color stories. And join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg where you can see a lot more of my comics. You can download some of my out-of-print stuff. And, uh, yeah, join me there. Red Room Trigger Warnings, Red Room the Antisocial Network, trade paperbacks are in stores as we speak. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. In Red Room Comics, each book contains four self-contained stories, plus 70 pages pages or more of additional materials, uh, new artwork, behind-the-scenes commentaries, things like that. Uh, these books are available at finer comic shops, Amazon, online, wherever you may go. i um, serialized new Red Room material on my Patreon right now uh, at patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there. All these links are available uh, in my link tree in the description below this video. Jimmy, tell the people what else is out there. Subscribe to the Cartoonist KFAB newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist KFAB t-shirts, merchandise, mugs, fanny packs, and more at our spread shop at the links below this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist KFAB channel, given those marching orders will be on our way. Read more comics.